in this lecture we will be discussing on machine shop let us first try to understand some of the basic terminologies related to machine shop the first one is the machine machine is a device which transforms power into useful work by mechanisms some of the examples of machines are pump turbine generator motor shaper lathe all these are different kinds of machine in the definition of machine we have seen that in the machine there are many mechanisms so what is mechanism so mechanism is uh, they are basically the connected rigid links having relative motion among them technically uh, this can be called as closed kinematic chain okay so basically in mechanism they are rigidly connected rigidly rigid links connected by some joints may be revolute or prismatic or whatever that may be and through that they will form a closed kinematic chain in by that you can see that in one link if we give some motion that motion will be transmitted from one link to the other link through some relative motion among them so this is what is mechanism this is a very simple example of a four bar mechanism that i have shown but similar kind of uh, mechanisms are there in any machines if you see now coming to the uh, next very important term which is machining it is defined as the process by which irregular size and shaped material which is also called blank is converted to finished product by removing excess material from the surface okay and some of the examples of different machining processes like turning or the drilling or the shaping these are the different kinds of machining process by which we can remove the material from the surface and ultimately produce the finished product according to some given shape and size now coming to the last one in this list that is the machine tool so machine tool is a machine that performs machining operations example lathe shaper milling these are different kinds of machine tool the thing that you have to remember that uh, machine tool is basically the subset of the machine and they are special purpose machine which are used to perform machining operations now in this particular lecture we are going to discuss uh, these topics like uh, machining operations in lathe types of lathe parts of lathe and lathe accessories specification of lathe mechanisms in lathe cutting tool types and materials cutting fluid and safety that we should follow in the machine shop here in this picture you can see that how a lathe machine look like so here you can see this is the lathe machine tool and the different parts has been shown now in this slide you can see the different kinds of machining operations okay so in the first picture you can see this particular operation is called the straight turning operation okay the turning operation is a process by which we can reduce the diameter of a cylindrical object okay when we finally create a cylindrical object then it is called a straight turning so what is the speciality of the cylindrical object that along the axis uh, its diameter remains constant that's why it is called a straight turning on the other hand just below this straight turning you will see that another operation is going on which is called taper turning in a taper turning again the material is removed from the surface and the diameter is gradually uh, changing along the axis uh, that means a, a taper is there in the final job or the finished job and for that as you can see here uh, the compound rest actually swiveled and then the longitudinal feed is given so by longitudinal feed what we mean that the motion of the cutting tool uh, that is given along the axis of the job as you can see in both these uh, cases 
along the axis of the job you are giving the feed motion okay now coming to the uh, this particular operation which is the facing operation where you can see the tool is given a motion which is perpendicular to the axis and from the circumference to the center if you move the cutting tool then you can see that by this process you can reduce the length of the job and this particular operation is called facing operation now here in this picture you can see it's a thread cutting operation as a helical groove that is cut which is basically called the thread and that operation can be done on lathe now here you can see a uh, drilling operation and the drilling operation is basically uh, a hole making operation if you uh, want to cut a hole then with the help of this particular kind of cutting tool which is called the drill bit which is used and the process uh, is called the drilling operation and this also can be done in lathe in the boring operation you can see the boring operation is that suppose there is some existing hole and you want to increase the diameter of that hole that particular process is called the boring operation okay and here you can see uh, this boring operation also can be done on a lathe so the operations or the machining operations that you can see here all these operations can be done on a lathe now few more machining operations which we can also done in lathe is like knurling operation here you can see on the surface of a cylindrical uh, blank what you are doing is creating some impression and so that the friction on the surface increases so that you can grip that particular surface and for that this special kind of tool which is called the knurling tool which is used and this particular process of giving this kind of an impression is called knurling operation now see in this picture the next one you see here in this picture uh, which is the chamfering operation the chamfering operation is basically to avoid the sharp edges uh, generally what is done along the circumference a small angular deviation is created okay so this particular operation is called the chamfering operation and this you can see also can be done on lathe here this particular operation is the grooving operation and you can see a special kind of grooving tool which is used and here you can see that how the groove is cut on the job now coming to the next topic which is the different types of lathe lathe can be of different kinds here in the first picture you can see it's a speed lathe uh, from the construction point of view it's a very simple and there is no as such uh, any gear mechanism by which you can reduce the speed of the lathe so it's almost operating at the same speed as that of the motor so that is why it's operating at a very high speed that's why it's called the speed lathe and speed lathes are generally used for light duty applications with the soft material here you can see for the wood cutting you can also use this kind of lathe this is a simple uh, lathe now coming to the next one which is the engine lathe and in case of an engine lathe the range of speeds are more if you compare with respect to speed lathe which was only the speed of the motor at which the lathe is working here in case of engine lathe there are arrangement of the gears and all that by which you can give multiple number of speeds because many cutting operations for the metals you require uh, low speed it depend the speed of the uh, work depends on uh, the tool and the work that what you are using the kind of uh, machining that you want to make on the job so it depends on many factors so engine lathes are preferred for those cases and an uh, automatic feed mechanism is also there in case of engine lathe there are a separate tool post where you can hold the tool okay so these are the definite improvement over the uh, speed lathe initially uh, the uh, when this kind of lathe was introduced at that time steam engine was used to power the lathe and that's why the name is the engine lathe next coming to the bench lathe 
bench length is similar to the engine length only thing the size of the bench length is small and it is set on a bench and generally used for the uh, small precise fork okay next coming to the uh, tool room length in case of a tool room length the availability of the range of speeds is much higher than the engine length and they are generally used for a very precise and accurate work next you see that uh, turret lathe and the capstan lathe and these in this kind of lathes and these are definite improvement over the typical engine lathe because in this kind of lathes you can see that you can reduce the uh, time of the tool change okay so in case of engine lathe there was tool post tool holder and all these things but uh, when you want to do some different operation a different tool is to be set and for that you require time so that uh, so for the mass production uh, it is always an intention that you reduce the overall machining time and that can be done when multiple uh, cutting operation is to be done on the same job uh, then uh, many tool you require to be changed so here you can see in case of a turret lathe or the capstan lathe in both the cases you will see this particular turret is there it's a hexagonal turret where you can see that these are the slots where you can set the uh, six different kinds of tools at the same time and whenever cutting multiple cutting operations are going to occur then you can change this cutting tool one after another according to the requirement so your tool changing time can be reduced and here also the similar kind of a turret you will observe in case of a capstan lathe turret lathes are generally used for the heavy duty operation whereas the capstan lathe uh, construction wise uh, very minor differences are there between turret and capstan lathe just only thing you try to remember that capstan lathes are generally used for respectively light duty operations with respect to the turret lathe next you see that the cnc lathe in case of a cnc lathe uh, it is a automatic basically where uh, through computer uh, uh, coding you can uh, create the motion of the tool you can uh, give the command for the tool change uh, cutting fluid supply and everything and automatically tool will change and the cutting operation depth of cut feed everything can be controlled through the coding so once the coding from the remote place is done then that coding uh, according to the coding the whole operation will be automatic okay so this is uh, very popular nowadays in different industries and definitely uh, we can make uh, accurate and precise for at the same time it's a safe for from the point of view of the workers because workers from a remote uh, position in a they can control the whole operation now coming to the different parts of the lathe so in the lathe if you see that uh, this part of the lathe which is called the head stock this part is the head stock on the other hand uh, this particular part is called the tail stock okay these are the uh, two important parts and here you see that this is what is the lathe bed this one is the lathe bed and over the lathe bed uh, this uh, green colored thing that is sliding over the lathe bed which is called the saddle here in this picture uh, you can see this is what is uh, saddle which is basically sliding over the lathe bed and here you can see that uh, there is a mechanism uh, by which if you rotate this hand wheel through which uh, you can give motion uh, to the uh, this particular carriage the whole thing is called the carriage and that carriage will move over the lathe bed okay so some mechanism is there and this particular mechanism is the apron mechanism uh, in this lecture in the later part we will discuss in detail that how the apron mechanism is working now you see that just over the saddle uh, the part that you can see uh, this one 
is called the uh, cross slide this one is called the cross slide because through this handle you can move this particular cross slide in the perpendicular to the uh, direction of the lathe bed and just above this cross slide the part which is called the compound rest so this part is actually the compound rest which is above the cross slide and here you can see this is the tool post where you can uh, fit the cutting tool here you can fit the cutting tool in the tool holder or cutting tool directly can be fit here in the tool post okay this part is chuck which is a job holding device it is not the part of a lathe it is basically an accessory of the lathe here you can see two very important uh, thing one is the feed rod or the feed shaft and another one you see that there is a threaded rod which is the lead screw so this one is the lead screw which is threaded one and there is no thread in the other one which is the feed rod or the feed shaft okay so the, this part is the carriage this one is the headstock this one is the tail stock and the carriage moves over the lathe bed and uh, feed rod and lead screw they are used to keep the automatic feed to the carriage okay so these are the main parts of the lathe definitely here is a gear box here is a gear train okay uh, that we will discuss in the later part of the video. Now, dead center, you can see that uh, dead center and the live center, they looks like this. Okay. And the other end, if you observe carefully, that there is some more stepper, which is there. And this part, they are fixed with the spindle. Either they are fitted with the headstock spindle or the tailstock spindle uh, if the spindle is fitted with the headstock then definitely uh, that particular center uh, will rotate along with the spindle if it is fitted with the spindle. here you can see this particular center this is the center and here you see that the uh, headstock spindle this is what is the headstock spindle and within that extra spindle the center is there center is actually fixed and then when the headstock spindle will rotate this center will also rotate okay so that if the job is connected actually if this is the job and this is the center okay so when uh, the spindle will rotate when the job is rotating the spindle also rotating okay if both the job and spindle are rotating then there is no relative motion between the job and the spindle and since the spindle uh, since the center is rotating along with the job then it is called the life center then it is called the life center Sometimes what happens that in the tail stock, in the tail stock, this is the tail stock end you can see, and this is what is the tail stock spindle. And in the tail stock spindle, if you connect a center like this, and when the job is rotating, you see that this tail stock spindle is not rotating or the center is not rotating. If this is the situation that the center is not rotating with respect to the job, then there is a relative motion between the center between that center and the job and this particular this particular uh, thing is what is called dead center this particular center then is called the dead center because that particular center is not rotating with the job okay so definitely if the there is relative motion between the center and the job definitely large heat will be generated and that may decrease the 
strength of the center and that is why you will find at the end of the uh, center uh, at the tip of the center it is generally made of very hard material so that it can sustain its hardness even at a very high temperature generally carbide tips are used in the tear center so commonly most of the cases you will find that uh, tear centers are there in the tail stock and if all the time you will find that the life centers are connected at the uh, head stock spindle but it is also possible that the life centers can also be attached in the tail stock because when the uh, operation is a very high speed operation in that case what happens that even if the uh, tip is very hard then but still uh, because of a very high speed operation it is possible that the temperature uh, will be very high and that is why in that case there is a chance that the center material tip of the center material may be damaged so in those cases what uh, one can do uh, they can also use this kind of a life center where this particular center is not a general center you can see it is a revolving center and here you see uh, this is basically if you go inside this is basically a bearing where uh, you will find that this particular part is at rest with the tailstock spindle this part is at rest with the tailstock spindle but this front part which is rotating along with the job so that the uh, relative motion between the job and the center is respectively less and that is why the heat generation will be less okay so uh, one end this end is basically free to rotate with the job but this end is fixed with the tail stock and that is done by the bearing arrangement here okay generally taper roller bearings are there so life centers can also be used at the tail stock end now coming to the other types of accessories that we see here you see this is the chuck so here you can see this is the four jaw chuck because there are four different jaws uh, which we can adjust to hold the job between these jaws so job can be holded here uh, because in turning operation or any lathe operations it is possible that uh, you can hold the job with the help of a chuck okay so in place of a lathe centers uh, we can use chuck to hold the job then uh, you see that the chuck can be either three jaw or it can be four jaw in case of a three jaw chuck in case of a three jaw chuck uh, it is basically here you can see this is the end where with the help of this key you can adjust the jaws and in case of a three jaw chuck uh, if you adjust one particular jaw automatically the other jaws will be adjusted in case of a four jaw chuck independently four different jaws you have to adjust with the help of this chuck key okay so the main purpose of using chuck is to hold the job at the head stock if you want to hold the job uh, one end by the chuck if the length is very long in that case uh, when the cutting operation is going on there is a chance that it can bend easily and so definitely it will affect the dimensional accuracy and it can also create the vibration during the operation so to avoid that you need some support and that support can be given with the help of a tailstock center so uh, what we can do that uh, at the tailstock spindle we can put the center and we can give the support so one end is the chuck and other end is the tailstock center and we can uh, do the cutting operation so when uh, this is required if the length of the job is long but if the length of the job is very short in that case only uh, you just hold it in the headstock uh, in the chuck and you do the cutting operation 
that is sufficient but if the length is long in that case the support is needed this is one way of holding the job another way of holding the job you can also hold the job between two centers that means here you can think in that way that here uh, in the head stock spindle this is the center there and in the uh, tail stock spindle this is the center now uh, if you want to turn a job uh, between two centers uh, in case of a light mate uh, in case of uh, wood or plastic might, might be this will work and you can uh, do the uh, cutting operation but if it is a metal then uh, what will happen that uh, <coughs> it will uh, rotate but uh, the spindle is not going to rotate this job actually okay so spindle is not going to rotate the job so if this is the spindle and this is the job uh, and the power is coming to this uh, this is the spindle power is spindle remember spindle is nothing but a hollow shell this is what is called the spindle okay so inside that spindle the center is there so power is actually coming to the center center is rotating but center is uh, basically here is a cone shaped thing so in the job end it is basically the cone kind of a thing and this center is also like this so by rotating the spindle it is not possible to rotate the job so what is done with the help we take the help of a face plate okay so here you can see uh, this is what is the face plate you can see the face plate you can see this is the face plate face plate look like this and what we can do in the face plate you can see there are slots and uh, this particular thing is what is called the uh, lathe dog okay lathe dog d o g lathe dog okay so with the help of a lathe dog uh, we can this health dog is actually connected here lathe dog is connected here and with the help by tightening this particular bolt here uh, or this particular bolt you can hold the job here and what is done here you can see that either it can be extended uh, like this along with the lathe dog or it can be without it uh, but in that case what is done uh, extra pin which is coming uh, that is basically coming from this slot uh, that is used or uh, if it is extended like a pin then that pin is engaged in the slot so that when the headstock spindle will rotate this face plate will also rotate and when the face plate will rotate that power through this pin goes to the lathe dog and lathe dog is tightly connected with the job so job is going to rotate so this is the way how the power is coming to the job and the job is going to rotate so this is the technique is used when you want to turn between two centers okay but if you use the chuck then definitely chuck is holding the job and when the power is coming to the chuck that is uh, rotating the job very simple to understand but if it is if you try to uh, cut between two centers in that case if you try to hold the job between two centers in that case definitely you have to use the lathe dog you have to use the lathe dog so lathe dog is an accessory here you can see this is what is the uh, typical tool holder so tool holder like this and this tool holder actually set in the tool post so tool holder is set here then these are tightened and at the front of the tool holder you can put the cutting tool you can put the cutting tool and here you can see so here basically this one is the allen bolt and this one is the allen key these are not uh, allen bolt because their head if you see they are basically square kind of a uh, head is there and that is why this kind of a key which is used to loosen or tighten this particular 
squeeze. Versus these two are considered dead centers. The live center has ball bearings in it, so this piece will rotate and reduce the amount of friction against the workpiece. So we're going to go ahead and use that since we do have it. If you are going to use a dead center, then you have to frequently lubricate this point, uh, very frequently lubricate this point, and also check the tightness of it. But these simply fit in by friction. The Morse taper, you, they may look straight to you at first glance, but there is a very, very slight um, angle on them. It's, it's only about one and a half degrees, if I remember off the top of my head. Each Morse taper size is a slightly different angle. Now we have our tailstock that we can slide in and out, and we've got that beveled hole on either end. Now we'll lock down the tailstock to the bed of the lathe, and then we'll use the ram just to put a little bit of tension on there, and then we'll this would be a complete setup of center. A couple other pieces come into play because it's a flat, a flat surface against a flat surface, or I should say conical surface against conical surface. So we can hold this and turn the head. Um, so that's definitely something we don't want. This is where a couple other pieces come into play. So we're going to bring that faceplate back. That was for a drive dog. Um, I believe these come with all the, the lathe packages, both the faceplate and the drive dog. So we're going to take our piece out. Put our faceplate on. And we still have that center in there. Now we're going to put the dog over the workpiece like so. and move our centers back into place, tighten that back down. Now the drive dog ends up cinching down on the workpiece with this screw and there's a v-notch on here and it engages in that slot. Now the reason it's a slot, keep your hands well away from that chuck, as we go higher and higher We'll end up blurring, and we can't really even see. You can see that this one is the motor. This one is the motor, and here you can see this is the motor shaft. And through this motor shaft, power coming from the motor to this pulley tray. Here you can see uh, this is a cone pulley tray, and the belt is connected between. Uh, this cone pulley with this cone pulley. So here you can see the pulley tray and this is called a cone pulley tray because it shapes like a cone and here you can see that there are one, two, three, four. There are to total four different slots and corresponding to each one you will get a particular speed. So four different speed by changing the belt in different slots we can get four different speeds so now you can see that how through the belt the power is transmitted from motor shaft to the head stop so four different rpm we can generate through this drive pulley drive so here you can see here you can see there is an arrangement by which you can change the center distance between the pulley so that you can change the belt. So here you can see that you can change the center distance so that you can change the belt whenever it is required. But these four speeds might not be enough. We require more number of speeds. We want to reduce the speeds further. So for that, there is a back gear arrangement there in the head stock. So here you see that this is the uh, pulley drive as you can see and here is the chuck where the job is. You can see this is the job and this one is the chuck. And this one is basically the gear which is 
directly connected with the shaft in the same shaft with the pulley so basically the arrangement is like this that uh, this is the shaft and in the same shaft uh, actually over the shaft there is a bearing and then over which this pulley arrangement the whole pulley arrangement is there this particular pulley arrangement is there and then this particular gear this is the gear and this gear is there okay and this shaft is connected to the headstock spindle here is the headstock spindle so it is connected with the headstock spindle okay and this headstock spindle is connected with this particular bull gear bull gear means basically the larger gear where this particular gear if you see this is called bull gear and this particular bull gear is uh, connected with the headstock spindle okay but this bull gear is not mounted over the bearing this bull gear is a keyed with the shaft it is keyed with the shaft that means when the shaft is rotating the bull gear is also rotating or the spindle is rotating okay so this bull gear is directly keyed with the headstock spindle and uh, so you can understand now that the arrangement is that initially this is the pulley and this is the gear they are mounted over the bearing that means uh, they can freely rotate over the uh, this particular shaft and or the spindle headstock spindle and this uh, particular gear this bull gear is connected directly through keyed through this particular shaft it is not over the bearing so bearing up to this much okay now how the back gear arrangement is done let us try to understand that so here you can see this is the pinion gear where the power is coming actually and here from this picture i think it will be clear if you see that initially through the pulley drive the power is coming to this uh, pulley and this pulley is rotating and it is rotating with the same speed this particular shaft will also rotate with the same speed and i think i mean this particular thing this particular pinion gear will also rotate with the same speed and now if the uh, there is a pin actually there is a pin here and through that pin uh, this bull gear can be connected with this pulley or it can be disengaged from the pulley so there is a pin okay so if we connect this uh, pin that means if we connect this bull gear with the pulley then what happens is that uh, when the pulley is uh, rotating the say uh, at the same speed uh, this particular bull gear will also rotate because the power will be transferred through this pin to the bull gear and when the bull gear will rotate the spindle will also rotate and this shaft will rotate at the same speed okay now uh, suppose we want to reduce the speed further then a reverted gear train which is used here you see in that case what is done uh, the power is first coming to this pulley and then uh, the that the same power is also there in the gear because that is on the same uh, bearing 
okay because this particular pinion here is also on the same bearing where this pulley is there okay but remember that uh, there is no connection between the headstock spindle the shaft which is inside uh, there uh, with the pulley because i have already told you uh, the shaft actually looks like this and here uh, this is the bearing and in this bearing basically so bearing you know that uh, it can independently rotate with respect to the shaft so the whole pulley arrangement the whole pulley arrangement if we call this is the whole pulley arrangement and the gear and this particular gear they are on the same bearing so when pulley is getting uh, when the pulley is rotating uh, it is also rotating with the same speed with this gear gear is also getting the same speed then uh, remember that when this gear or the pulley is rotating that power is not going into this shaft directly okay so now if you disengage that particular pin so now if you disengage that pin from the pulley then definitely the spindle is not going to rotate then spindle is not going to rotate because uh, power is not going to transfer from the pulley to the pull gear because spindle is directly connected to the pull gear only okay so what will happen in that case if we engage this back gear then from this pinion it will go to this gear and since these two gear are directly keyed with this shaft okay so power this it will also rotate with the same speed as this one okay then the power will be transferred from this gear to the bull gear because now they are engaged so it is clear that the first of all here if you see the number of teeth there in the pinion gear and the uh, this particular gear which is connected with this one so definitely the uh, speed will be reduced in the first uh, from this shaft to this shaft then again the speed will be reduced when the power is transmitted from this shaft to the pull gear again because the number of teeth that is increasing from here to here so that means the speed is going to reduce again here if you see that the number of teeth is increasing so speed is going to reduce further so finally the pull gear will rotate at a respectively slower speed if you compare with the rotational speed of this pulley or this gear so we can rotate by the back gear arrangement uh, at a much slower speed and which is uh, basically required for the thread cutting operation or the reaming operation we require this kind of a slow speed operation okay so i think uh, the idea of this headstock uh, back gear arrangement is clear to you so i think uh, in this particular video that part has been shown here how the power how the back gear is arranged and how the the pin are engaging and disengaging of the pin this is what is the uh, inverted gear the the uh, this is directly connected with the uh, headstock uh, the shaft at the headstock the connected to the headstock spindle so this is also rotating uh, with the speed of the headstock spindle so now uh, power is required to be transferred to this particular gear box and from that gear box it is to be transferred to the uh, either feed rod or the lead skin so for that you see that there are two gears present here and two uh, two gears uh, can be changed by this particular lever okay so what happens uh, you see that uh, this is basically the spindle gear so headstock spindle gear and that power is transferred to either a or b depending upon the arrangement or the lever position that you 
want to maintain okay so in this arrangement you can see the power is uh, transferred from the spindle gear to this a gear and then from a gear to this uh, drive gear and then from this drive gear to this intermediate gear here you see this intermediate gear and finally this intermediate gear to the uh, this particular gear that he is uh, ultimately transferring the power to the gearbox so if you see the direction of rotation then you will understand that at this kind of an arrangement when a is connected in this way and in that case you see that if the uh, headstock spindle is rotating suppose in this direction which is uh, here i'm showing in the and uh, in the clockwise direction then you see that this a gear will rotate in the opposite direction okay which is anti clockwise then this intermediate uh, then driver gear will rotate in the same direction as that of the spindle gear then this one which is the intermediate gear will rotate in the opposite direction and finally uh, the gear box will rotate exactly in the same direction as that of the headstock spindle so headstock spindle and the uh, final uh, gear uh, that uh, is going to the gear box is rotating in the same direction now if you just engage the gear uh, gear b uh, we along uh, uh, gear b with this uh, uh, spindle gear then what will happen you see you see this arrangement this is the other arrangement where you see that b is connected with the spindle gear and in this case you will just observe the opposite thing is going to happen that means the spindle gear rotation and the final driven gear rotation are opposite to each other when the a was connected then they are in the same direction but when the b is connected you see that they ultimately they are rotating in the opposite direction so in this way we can change the direction so what actually happens by changing this direction is that it decide that whether uh, the carriage is going to move from the uh, headstock to the tailstock all it is going to move from tail stock to the head stock so whenever uh, we require different kinds of direction of longitudinal feet we can change the tumbler gear position so that we can control automatic control of the movement of the carriage now here you see the forward motion the a gear is engaged with the spindle gear then in the second position in the reverse position you see that the b is connected then the third position is the neutral position where you see that the intermediate gear is now not connected with the driver gear now see another mechanism so we have seen two mechanism first of all we have seen one pulley then we have seen the back gear arrangement then we have seen the tumbler gear mechanism now see apron mechanism so let us try to understand the apron mechanism and in this apron mechanism as you can see that this is what is the lathe bed as you can see and here you see that this is particularly is the gear which is connected with the lever okay and on the other side if you see it is connected with the lever and by rotating this lever you can directly give manually you can give motion to the carriage so what is there if you see from the other side if you see from the other side you will find that there is a pinion gear and 
pinion gear is basically the driver gear and when you are rotating the wheel basically this pinion gear is going to rotate and this pinion gear is meshed with this rack here you can see this is what is the rack and when the pinion gear mesh with the rack the motion is transferred so the rotational motion of the hand wheel is converted into longitudinal motion of the carriage so let us see on the other side here you can see as if you are rotating the hand wheel and you see that how the motion is passing to the rack now you see that in case of a cross feed cross feed is basically the motion by which you can move the uh, cross slide perpendicular to the uh, direction of the bed here you see this is what is the cross slide motion now you observe here a screw mechanism is there simple screw nut mechanism by which the cross slide works now you see that hand wheel you can you have already understood and here you see just here this is the hand wheel part uh, if you rotate the hand wheel this one is the hand wheel if you rotate the hand wheel this black gear will rotate and in the, in the same shape this uh, yellow colored gear is there which is the basically the pinion gear and this pinion mesh with the rack and uh, when you are rotating the hand wheel basically uh, the uh, through this uh, mechanism basically the carriage moves over the bed okay so now you observe how we can give the automatic feed so here you see uh, if you connect uh, there is a here you can see through this lever through this mechanism it is possible to either uh, connect with this one or it can be connect with this one if you connect this blue one with this black one then the longitudinal feed will be result and if you connect this blue one with this black one then it is the cross feed which is the result okay so by manually there should there is a switch uh, manual uh, either handle or something uh, through that handle you can change the lever position so that either you want the uh, automatic feed or you want the power feed that you can control through this lever now here you see that feed rod here now we are going to see the automatic feed mechanism we have seen what will happen in the hand wheel now see the automatic feed mechanism so here if you observe though you have understood the position of the lever can be changed either with this one or this one and here you see this green colored thing which is basically the worm okay and this one this larger one is what is called the worm wheel or the worm gear okay so what happens and this is what is the feed rod and feed rod basically there is it is not a threaded one only a small portion there is helical group present which is called the worm okay and it is connected with this particular wheel which is called worm wheel or the worm gear and the power is transmitted uh, from the feed rod to this form and you can see that when uh, depending upon the rotation and speed of the feed rod uh, that will control the rotation of this brown colored gear and that will ultimately control the rotation of this blue colored gear and then finally this blue colored gear will either engage with the longitudinal feed or with the cross feed by the position of the lever so in this way automatically either you can give the cross feed or you can give the longitudinal feed uh, longitudinal feed by changing the lever position 
so here you see that how it is done here you see that first of all it is shown with the hand wheel at that time there is no power to the feed rod so feed rod is now not rotating now if you give the automatic feed to the feed rod and if you engage either power feed or the longitudinal feed you see that when the feed rod is rotating and here you see that this particular slot you can see here this is what is called the keyway okay this is what is called the keyway so through key basically this wand is connected with the feed rod okay so power is actually transmitted from the feed rod to this wand is through key so here it is the wand and here you can see how the power is transmitted from warm to one wheel or the one gear and then through this lever position and this intermediate gear ultimately either you can give the longitudinal or you can give the cross feed here you see that how longitudinal feed automatic longitudinal feed is given to the carriage you see from the other side Now, if you change the gear position, give the cross feed, you see, you can give the cross feed as well by changing the lever position. Okay. So, now let us see uh, how we can give power to the carriage mm, through lead screw and it is generally used when we want to cut threads here you can see so there is an arrangement called the half nut mechanism here this particular half nut is engaged with the lead screw and the power is transmitted so the rotational motion of the lead screw is converted into linear motion of the carriage so this motion transfer either can be done in feed rod that we have seen uh, in the apron and the same thing within the apron also the lead screw arrangement uh, is also there and there you can see how it is working so through the half knot mechanism basically so in this picture maybe you can see the half knot how it looks like so here this is basically the apron so one is connected with the saddle through this here you see the apron is taken out from the machine so this is what is the half knot so here you see this one is the half knot you see that you half part you half corresponding threaded part which is when engaged with the lead screw, so power is transmitted to the carriage. Now you see that how a thread is cut because lead screw is engaged when we actually require to cut a thread with a specific pitch and in doing so it is very important to at a different pass you have to start from the same position otherwise your thread will not be perfect so for that you see that in this this is what is the tool post you can see now 
this is the gearbox here you see the lead screen this one is the lead screen you see the threaded rod which is the lead screen and this one is the threading dial okay now this particular threading dial is used to actually locate the position of the lead screen and which is very very important in thread cutting because the position of the carriage is not important the important thing is the position of the lead screen okay so that is accurately maintained with the help of this thread chasing dial and if you see how it works i think this is a very good video so that you will understand So first thing you remember that for thread cutting generally it is working at a very low speed so back gear should be engaged and now you see in the thread chasing dial when it is exactly one at that position you engage the half nut. This particular lever is the, the person is pushing means uh, he is basically engaging the half nut. So by engaging the half nut means the two uh, uh, half nut basically now uh, uh, press or catch the lead screw so that it will follow the motion of the lead screw and the carriage is going to move and if you release the this particular lever then half nut will be released and no longer carriage will automatically uh, move with the lead screw okay so when the half nut is to be engaged here uh, when it is exactly one then half nut is engaged already depth of cut is given now uh, automatically carriage is going to move uh, according to the different gear setting and uh, a particular tpi will be cut now you see the operation that uh, thread cutting operation is going on now you see that when it is released and you, you, if you come back and again when you have to engage remember you have to start from the same position so that it will go on the same slots only okay and then again disengage come back and give depth of cut more depth of cut and follow so from any position of the carriage you can actually start this operation it is not going to uh, spoil your threads as long as you maintain the position of the thread chasing dial in thread cutting operation okay so okay next is uh, specification of thread In specification of lathe, we'll see that uh, what are the different uh, dimensions or the different parameters that uh, you should mention when you need a particular machine. So here you can see the first point, it is the height of the center. Height of the center is as shown here. You can see uh, this height here, this is the center and the height of the center is this one. This is the height of the center. So, over the bed, if you see that what is the height of the center, then a swing over bed. Now, the swing over bed is basically uh, the distance uh, which is uh, from the bed to the this position. So, which is basically uh, which is basically the double the distance from the bed and this is important that this will tell you that what is the maximum diameter of the job uh, the external diameter of the job that can be accommodated in that particular machine okay then swing over slide 
swing over slide. So this particular distance is swing over slide. Uh, this is also another very important specification. Then the length of the bed. Definitely the length of the bed as you can see. This is the distance length of the bed is another important specification. Admit between centers. So the maximum distance between the center is again another very important uh, specification. Then uh, lead screw pitch. So that is also very important. The lead screw pitch generally it is uh, either 6 dpi or 8 dpi or 4 dpi there are there can be different kinds of uh, lead screw uh, the commonly used lead screw pitches are like 4 dpi or the 6 dpi which are common and in this regard i just want to mention the generally the lead screw threads are of acme thread you just try to remember acme thread because ACME threads are suitable for the power transmitting threads and generally used for the heavy torque transmission. A square thread also can be used. Square threads also can be used for the lead screw. Uh, but ACME threads are much more efficient if you compare with respect to the square threads. Now, uh, cross slide travel that is also important that how much maximum distance the cross slide can move perpendicular to the bed then bed width so bed width is again another dimension important dimension the range of spindle speed how many different speeds can be accommodated in that particular machine too and the spindle bore spindle bore is also important so what is the spindle bore yeah, that means I have already told you the spindle is a hollow uh, cylindrical device. So the bore diameter means the internal diameter of the hole of the spindle. So that is again another important specification. And some of the common specifications like the weight of the machine, the floor space requirement, the thin power, uh, these are the common specification in all the machine tools. But these are important with respect to Length. Now coming to the cutting tool. And cutting tool can be of different kinds, but a uh, few things you should remember. Like it can be single point cutting tool, it can be multi point cutting tool. Uh, most of the cutting tools used for the turning or the facing or these uh, these cutting tools are single point cutting tool. Okay, so here you can see a typical uh, turning tool, uh, and here some of the very important parts like this one is the shank, and if you see this surface is called the uh, major flank surface, and this one is the uh, main rake surface, and this one is the minor flank. So these are the uh, important surfaces if you see, and this one is the primary cutting edge okay. this one is the primary cutting edge and this one is the secondary cutting edge you can say okay and other than that here is the nose this part is called the heel and these things are there but two very important angles uh, with respect to the any cutting tool are important and try to remember this so one thing is the rake angle, another one is the clearance angle. These two things are very, very important. So here you see this is the job and suppose the job is moving in this direction. And here you see this is the cutting tool. This one is the cutting tool. And you see that uh, one surface of the cutting tool is there is a clearance between the tool surface and the job surface and which is very important otherwise what will happen the tool surface will slide over the 
job surface and ultimately this is the finished part of the job you observe this is the finished part of the job so ultimately job will get damaged its dimensional accuracy will be sacrificed so this angle is very very important which is called the clearance angle this angle is called the clearance angle and another one you see that this is the chip that is flowing out from the uh, job and it is going past the uh, cutting tool surface so at this region the cutting tool and the cutting tool and the chip this is the chip and this is the cutting tool so this is what is the reference plane and with respect to this reference plane the cutting tool makes an angle and this particular angle is called the rake angle okay so you can understand that if the rake angle is uh, uh, negative rake angle is negative means basically here it is shown a positive rake angle but it can be negative that means in that case cutting tool will be like this so you see that in the opposite side of the uh, reference plane this angle is so this is the example of a negative rake angle okay so if it is a negative rake angle sometimes it is suitable so that the chip will uh, break very quickly and it will go out it will help to uh, break quickly okay so sometimes the negative rake angle is very common in operations uh, it can be positive or negative but definitely the clearance angle must be a positive one clearance angle must be a positive one but rake angle can be both positive and negative so only thing that you have to remember that the with the tool surface uh, it is with respect to the reference plane the rake surface makes an angle or the tool rake surface makes an angle is the rake angle and the tool surface that makes an angle with the job uh, finished job uh, surface that is what is the clearance angle and these two angles are very very important next uh, you see that uh, there can be uh, this particular tool is what is the boring tool this particular tool what is the drilling a drill bit basically okay this uh, drilling tool is called the drill bit and the different parts of the drill bit you can see the flutes are basically the slots through which the chip when you are creating hole with the help of a drill bit then the chip that is forming that actually came out uh, through these slots uh, through these grooves okay and these are called the flutes flutes of the drill okay uh, and uh, you can see here different kinds of rimmers these are different kinds of rimmers which are used rimmers are basically rimming operation is basically uh, an op finishing operation uh, of a hole so when you try to finish a particular hole then uh, after boring generally the rimming operation is done uh, so that uh, the finishing will be very high okay so uh, you can see the rimming tools are similar to the uh, drill bits uh, here you can see this is the knurling tool already you have seen so there can be different kinds of uh, cutting tool uh, that we can use in lead for different machining operations now uh, regarding the material of the cutting tool here you see that uh, different kinds of materials can be used for the cutting tool it can be high carbon steel uh, it can be high speed steel it can be stellite cemented carbide it can be ceramics cubic boron nitride or polycrystalline diamond so these are the different uh, cutting tools which can be used and chronologically if you go from top to bottom you will get that the tools are becoming more and more hard so hardness increases if you go in the bottom on the other hand if you see the toughness the toughness increases if you go from bottom to the top so two important uh, thing the hardness is a very important property hardness is a very important property that we require and not only that you know that at a very high temperature the hardness are required and if you see what are the important desirable properties of the cutting tool that is required like 
red hardness the red hardness is hardness at elevated temperature then it is the toughness toughness is so that the impact forces on the tool can be taken okay toughness that means it can take some amount of uh, shock load okay then uh, wear resistance uh, to abrasion that is also important so that the tool will not to life will increase it will not wear very quickly and the chemical stability definitely it does not react chemically with the job material and the cutting fluid and definitely at a very high temperature it should not be unstable form. okay so these are the important uh, characteristics that is required for the cutting fluid uh, for the uh, cutting tool and here you see that high carbon steel uh, generally the carbon percentage is more than uh, 0.7 percent okay it can be 0.891 like that in high speed steel you see that there are different grades of high speed steel uh, it can be tungsten series or it can be molybdenum series okay uh, the tungsten series if you see the composition is 18 is to 4 is to 1 tungsten chromium and vanadium and uh, carbon percentage is 0.7 and the remaining portion definitely is the iron whereas in the molybdenum series which is more common as the hss in industries uh, where a uh, small amount of tungsten is there which is 1.5 and 41 chromium vanadium is same molybdenum percentage is 8.5 okay and the carbon percentage is 0.8 the remaining thing is iron okay so these are uh, important compositions that you have to remember and uh, tungsten remember is a costly so that is why the monobotanum uh, replaced uh, tungsten now stellites uh, is uh, the trade name of the non-ferrous cast alloy composed of cobalt chromium and tungsten so that is stellites this one okay and um, coated carbides are or the cemented carbides which are also commonly used in cutting tools they're very hard and used for very hard materials generally uh, tungsten carbide uh, is the base metal and over that basically titanium nitride or titanium carbide okay this kind of a coating this kind of a uh, coating is given over this uh, tungsten carbide and that is what is the cemented carbide then ceramic materials uh, can be used to different kinds of ceramic materials like alumina, aluminium oxide, silicon carbide. Okay, so this can also be used as a cutting tool material. Then cubic boron nitride uh, is definitely is a very hard material can be used as a cutting tool material. And in this regard, uh, sarmet is again another uh, very useful cutting tool material. So what is sarmet? A sarmet is a composite material composed of ceramic and metal material that is why the name is sarmet sar for ceramic and met for metal actually example of the cemented carbide based on tungsten carbide cobalt and nickel and titanium carbide cobalt and nickel okay so here you can understand that tungsten carbide is basically a ceramic material whereas cobalt nickel they are metal Okay, similarly, here you see that titanium carbide is the ceramic and cobalt nickel they are metal. So they are composites of the ceramic and metals which are used as cutting tool. Now cutting fluid. So cutting fluid, the function of the cutting fluid if you see <laughs> that cutting fluid can be used as a coolant and uh, they are used as a coolant to reduce heat generation at the cutting zone as a lubricant they also can be used to reduce the friction at the either tool chip or a tool work interface so cutting fluid can be used as either a coolant or it can be used as lubricant or as a cleaner this also can be used like wash away chips and 
improve dimensional stability of the workpiece because if the temperature of the workpiece is very high then definitely dimensional stability will not be there so by using the cutting fluid it can maintain the dimensional stability so these are the important functions of the cooler, uh, cutting fluid as a coolant as a lubricant as a cleaner and improve dimensional stability now what are the desirable properties of the cutting fluid they should have very high thermal conductivity and large specific heat okay and good lubricating property low viscosity and low surface tension chemically stable at high temperature definitely non toxic and low cost now types of cutting fluid if you see that the straight cutting oils so straight cutting oils they are suitable as a lubricating purpose you can understand to reduce the friction on the other hand the water or water based fluids uh, they are generally used as a coolant okay to reduce the heat generation in the cutting zone actually what is done the combination of these cutting oils and the water based fluids are used as an emulsion uh, so that both the effect coolant and the lubricant both the effects uh, can be utilized and gases can also be used as a cutting uh, fluid uh, in that case generally compressed uh, nitrogen compressed air or the compressed um, uh, nitrogen compressed carbon dioxide these can also be used as a cutting fluid and it uh, solid lubricants like graphites can also be used now uh, the safety in the machine shop uh, we have to remember some of the points like we should have know that the position uh, of the main switch fire extinguisher first aid box wash machine in the machine zone then keep safe distance from the cutting zone during cutting operation and check that no object is on the machine before starting the machine this is very very important otherwise uh, accident can happen and make sure uh, that all the settings are perfect before you start the machine okay and wear apron covered shoe safety glasses tight clothes uh, these are important always keep the floor and the machine tool clean after machining okay so you have to remove all the chips and all that this is very very important and always be careful in the machine shop okay so and do not use mobile inside the machine shop so the main thing is that you always have to be very alert otherwise uh, there may be accident if you are unmindful thank you